on purpose, but not. Yeah, no, we can. Yeah. Not do what you want to. But yeah. On How are you doing? You doing okay? Up and down event. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, but I'm not known for my patience. So. Yes, okay, so um, I think I sent out a, me a, a, a reminder to everybody that one of the things I wanted to include in our meeting, um, and we'll go through some of our normal procedures, but I do want to spend some time um, understanding. I, I, I saw the minutes or the, this was the agenda from the last HAC meeting, maybe one prior, where, where there was the desire to set up committees for landscaping and finance and, and rules and regulations and that sort of thing. And it prompted me to want to understand more you know, how the HAC sees that that working and, and in more specific. So I don't, I, I'd like to kind of get through just whatever our basic um, reports are that need to be so done. So I and took then, your agenda as a homework assignment. Okay, good. And, good, and good. have attempted okay. to have communication with my peers. And okay, well, and, I, and it doesn't, have, I mean, this isn't no, the only we, meeting that's gonna discuss that. But I, I wanna, understand, I wanna, but, I but I at least wanted to have a yeah. uh, beginning of the conversation Perfect. that was representative okay. of not just me, but others. Perfect. That, and that's what I had hoped. Okay. All right. So I think the first thing would be is if, and given that, that, what, that I expect that to be a sort of lengthy conversation, and I want people to be free to talk, and I, and, and I know that I want to listen, I know Lori wants to listen. So everybody who does have to give a report could keep it to, you know, as, as brief as possible. And I guess I'd start with you, Jake. Um, <laughs> Nothing, huh? <laughs> Maybe brief. I, no, no, I saw a congratulations for improved landscaping on next door this morning. Yes. Maybe we should at least acknowledge that. Well, I would agree. Good. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're, get, we're getting there. And um, along with that is that we just came from a meeting where we talked about um, moving forward with the uh, landscape refurbishing schemes. Um, that was brought to you as well as most of the people around this table. And um, <laughs> I didn't go. Yeah, you didn't, but um, God, we all did. And um, Chris Williamson was on the phone, so he heard as well. And so that this is, um, we're continuing to push forward um, clearly with with the landscaping. And um, that though, that is one you're mentioning the street lights. I will. Okay, so I won't touch that. I'll let her address that um, and take it from there. Um, we're having again um, with our um, the list of work orders that we're getting that the majority of there are about 40 a month and about half of them are landscaping related. About a third of those are irrigation related which goes to the university's um, irrigation technician through their Azure system. And so we, we continue to, um, to streamline and get more information done. And it feels like that we're getting, uh, with, with Mia's help, which is integral to um, getting the details done. And so I, I, I'm sure there's lots of stuff. I'm, that's kind of what's on my mind right now. Um. So, so because street lights got mentioned, why don't I do the HAC report, brief part of it. Um, two issues came up at the HAC this month that they wanted discussed here. And the first is the street lights. Um, the, although everyone is excited to see us going to lights that reduce the uh, electricity used in the lights, um, there is great displeasure when you leave the apartment area where potentially the brighter lights are necessary for safety in apartment parking lights, etc. Once we enter the residential streets, the new street lights change what is the amber ambiance, and I'm told be friendly ambiance, of our existing lights to something that is in the range of five to six thousand Kelvin, which is a bright blue light. And that light blue light isn't very friendly to people, people sleeping, and to our insects and our wildlife in the neighborhood. So we're hoping that there is some way to address. And 
because this is a homeowner, town homeowner, and a W multifamily kind of joint issue. Maybe we can just come to a process that we can change the bulbs and go back to a 2700 Kelvin uh, kind of number. Yeah, I think that's something that's certainly open to, you know, further exploring and discussing. Um, you know, we obviously went through the exercise of replacing the street lights. The intent was to reduce energy consumption throughout the community, thereby resulting in savings for all of us. Um, the Arcan bills. Which we all applaud. And, and I think we were sensitive, I in particular was sensitive to light output, um, more so than temperature. And light output, uh, the current light the light output of the current bulbs is equal to or in fact less than that of the pre-existing bulbs granted the pre-existing bulbs were older and so they do lose some of their luminosity over time uh, but the temperature is certainly far cooler and so i think with that said and having heard the resounding <laughs> outpouring uh, feedback from the community i think that's something we're certainly open to addressing you know i have heard that in some locations and i think you even touched on that that the additional security lighting is beneficial. I've heard that in particular around some of the turnarounds. Um, and so I'm not sure what necessarily the ask is specifically in terms of do we change some but not others? Do we change all of them so there's consistency throughout the community? Has there been? I, the message we got loud and clear at our last HAC meeting was they all need to go back um, to the previous lighting. Mm -hmm. um, I think, Jake, is it appropriate um, to at least have the conversation where, where there is, might be a security concern with the police department? And yeah, in, in the conversation, um, I had, was just aware of temperature as far as the safety issue. I think that that's certainly something we can ask the police whether there is some, you know, overlay of security that would help make any decision. But, that, but basically, the yeah. community's resounding request is please, can we go back to 2700 <laughs> Kelvin? Yeah, and I don't know, that, look, we can certainly explore additional options. I can't sit here and guarantee that 2700 Kelvin is even available or an option within this bulb type, but I think it's something right. we're certainly open to looking right. at replacing and finding something that. Well, something that back down the More amber, agreeable. The amber to the perspective, large. I think, is, is where the community will Understood. And so I think to that effect, let me contact our electrician, but we can get up, you know, ultimately some samples, set up some sort of methodology whereby, you know, yeah. some people, whether it's some representatives or we open it to anybody who wants to take a look, but there needs to be some, you know, means by which we well, reach a, an agreement and are yeah, able we to- We on the HAC are happy to take the action item to gather a group of people, if you put, five samples up to gather a group of people, giving them the option to come, vote on the spot, having mm -hmm. walked to see all the samples, yep. and make a selection, and we will do a, a rather quick turnaround, because I think that's what our residents are asking okay. for, is as quick a change as we can <laughs> gotcha. get back to the, to the standard yes. goal. And I think what we've just demonstrated here is one of what I think is a really, is a really important value that the community advisory group should bring to the governance of the community. And that is that the, very, the varying ownership yeah. groups yeah. sitting down, mm -hmm. having a calm, quiet conversation. Here are the issues. This is what we know. What can we do about it? And making a decision here about what our next actions are. If, if I can address that, because I think the, uh, if anybody looked at the charter for this group, um, I will tell you that historically it is simply a carryover from the charter for the University of Glenn Corporation that was established in 2002. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a lot of that is not applicable anymore. But in terms of just getting the group started and getting it going, we just said let's follow that until we deem it necessary to, to rethink it. And it's being re rethunked right now. <laughs> um, but, but it was always the intent that this group um, 
Originally, we had some members of this group from the community who came here, and they simply came here as if they were going to an AJC meeting with their own individual issues. And what the purpose of this group is, is to have the, 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 the stakeholders in this community present here to interface with each other, to talk with each other, and to, if possible, like you're just like we just did, find a solution before it has to go any further. In other words, Lori doesn't have to do anything. She, you've already laid out between, you know, Ben has already said what, what, a way of trying to solve this problem. And that is the intent of this organization. So people who come here, even if they're a community member, if they come here um, to be participate in this group, it's not to bring their own personal problems, it's, it's to bring their perspective as a homeowner in the community and to, and to sort of help us um, address these issues so that, so that hopefully they can be solved before they ever have to go to the site authority. That's ideal, that may not always work, but, um, but you know, if you're the HAC, Ben is multifamily, site authority, some residents, you know, I'm sort of a, I'm just a, a guy. <laughs> so, so I've been asked to bring one other issue, and that's all I'll bring up now, and then we'll have okay. the other discussion when okay, we get sure. to it. The other issue, and, and Mary, and this is really, kind of you began this conversation last month, on the issue of, of issuing citations inside the neighborhood for with our really very minor um, deviations from the standards of the neighborhood. And we've had a very strong request from the community at our last meeting to see if we could come to an agreement where we could put all of those things on hold for a period of time while Gabriella and Chris work on the new rules committee. And we'll talk about what that group is intending to do when we get to that part of the conversation. And we get that information back in this group, we can take a look at it, and then have some more common sense guidelines for whether or not small decorative items can be approved to be in common space, uh, whether or not the occasional decorative pot can be approved to be in common space. And there, we, we relieve Jake of the time consuming task of sending these things out and listening to people go ah. um, until we get a better definition of what we think is truly important and that we ought to grapple with and what we simply should smile at or say would you please fill out a piece of paper because I will tell you if somebody came to my front porch I've learned that the bench and the two pillows I have on my front porch are actually sitting in common space and I need to file an application, which I haven't done yet. I thought that was part of my patio space, but apparently it's not. I think that that is, is part of our bigger discussion, um, addressing that so that the community might have some, and I, I don't want to open it just yet because I, I want to make sure that any other issues that we need to address are addressed, but, <laughs> but to me that's part of, of the HAC's expanded so, so I have one more that I will bring up when we get to that discussion, but that's the only, those okay. are the only two things that the AJC sent okay. me to say this week. Okay. Um, uh, ben, do you have anything else? Uh, no. Okay. okay. Well, then let's just kind of open it. Sorry. <laughs> no, my wife. She's like really mad that I hung up on her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so I have been thinking for a long and hard about, um, as I indicated earlier, um, people would come to the community or to this meeting sometimes with an individual issue. And what always, what I always struggle with is how do I know if we're gonna go to the site authority with something, how do I know that that's really representative of the community in general? And that's why sometimes I would kick it back and say, why don't you discuss that with the HAC? And as I kept doing that, I started realizing that, that maybe there is a, and we all recognize that this is a this is an affordable housing program to, to grow the university. That's what it is. But there are certainly a lot of opportunities for the residents and the HAC to participate more fully, in my opinion. And, and, and this is my opinion, by the way. And, and, but I'd like to have a discussion where we talk about, because I hear people say, um, we need to change the ground subways. I 
hear people say we need to, this needs to be an HOA, why can't we have more control? So I guess I like to explore what that really looks like and what everybody needs and, and, and in more specific terms than just we want to change the ground sublease. Because sometimes I wonder if you're talking about the rules and regulations or if you're talking about the actual ground sublease. I think that depends on who's speaking. I think it definitely depends on who's okay. speaking. There are people who have read the ground sublease thoroughly and they really are looking to change right. a particular line in the ground sublease. And there are folks who haven't read it and who are just using that as a generic and, and term. Can I point out one other thing? Because there's a document in here that I that that's called the disclosure form. Mm -hmm. A whole lot of people think this is the ground sublease, and it is not. Mm -hmm. we so, under, we, those of us who have read understand. Okay, just kind of want to yeah. make sure because even some people on the original site authority board weren't clear on that back in 2002. Right. So it's a it's an understandable mistake. So so go ahead. So let me start out with just one more example. And it comes from my spouse and I, my keeper, Stephen is in the corner. Um, I'm not allowed out without a keeper these days. Um, when we bought, we were handed a document that was one of these non-disclosure forms, which isn't the ground subsidies. Um, but it gave us a good explanation of how the community worked. Inside that document, which because we're sorting files, thanks to all this these days, Stephen read to me uh, about a week ago, and I found out where my misapprehension about earthquake insurance happened. In that document, we were told that it would be the site authority's responsibility to provide full earthquake insurance for the community, and that that would be charged to our maintenance rent, our common area maintenance fees. And based on that assumption, we went ahead and bought here. We paid cash for, because we had retirement age, we <coughs> paid cash for what we, what we bought as a townhome. And we proceeded to insure the parts of the townhome that we're, re we're required to maintain for earthquake and fire and flood. Because we live at the base of a hill where flood is actually an issue for us. Having done that for the five years now that we've lived here, um, I was pretty amazed to learn several months ago that the site authority does not maintain earthquake insurance on the property. And that what we have instead currently is um, basically emergency housing insurance so that we can all live someplace while things happen. But because there is no insurance on the infrastructure, there is no insurance on the rest of my townhome. My colleagues in single family homes can go and buy insurance on their entire house, but they also need the infrastructure insured in order for the community to be rebuilt. So I look at my insurance and I can't even get the insurance money I get unless I rebuild. If the other side of this handshake doesn't happen, that rebuilding can't happen. So that disclosure is to me illustrative of where I think many of us and most of the HAC is headed in this conversation. And that is to a way of operating where we're dealing with openness and accountability and the fiduciary responsibility that each of us hold in, in the community jointly is, is honored uh, because I think that's where we are. So let me kind of go through where I believe I have consensus from my colleagues. We as the current HAC members fully understand that our role is advisory in all areas except our limited authority over architectural questions. We seek to act as a forum for public education about issues that affect the community. For example, our last meeting, we had the folks from um, SCE presenting their dire threats to turn off all of our electricity, which by the way creates an interesting problem about how in the world do we set up standards for external power supplies. 
not, not a question I thought about in the past. As the only elected body in the community, we believe we should act as you're really describing that we should act, as a channel for communicating the community's views to the appropriate site authority staff or to the community advisory group. Working with the U Glen, the UCAM office, we act to improve the transparency and accountability of all the University Glen operations. And we've made significant progress by having an open budget and by having monthly expenditure reporting that's accessible to all residents if they chose to come and get it. Um, We believe that where we should be going in the future um, is to operate the community in partnership with all of the owners, with KW Multifamily, with the site authority as the owner of the ground, with the individual townhome and single family homeowners. We believe we should all be working to operate the community in the spirit of the Davis Sterling Act but not according to the precise letter potentially of the Davis Sterling Act, which is not applicable uh, in our community. We think this is the logical place, this group is the logical place to have the conversations that are intergroup and to attempt as far as possible to have resolution at this meeting of the particular issue or to have a clear pathway to a resolution, whether that's working with particular site authority staff or whether this group is establishing, asking further investigation be done by the, the budget advisory group or by the HAC and something comes back, but that things don't just come here to be discussed with no, no resolution point. And I think the frustration comes when things don't have a clear pathway to, to a resolution. Um, and, and we can't see basic, the basic accountability. I think those are kind of basic tenets that we don't think are revolutionary or anything else. The committees that we are attempting to es establish are attempting to take five people and multiply them into the community so that we can actually get enough broad input to speak intelligently about what the broader community is saying to us. And they're in the areas that we think are most important to the community. Where are the dollars being spent and how are they being spent? What does their neighborhood look like <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis? And how are they being governed? And I think that's, that's how we came up with those three groups. And I guess I'm really excited to see the HAC kind of move forward in this direction because I think what we're trying to do makes sense for the eventual, uh, what I call, uh, recognition of basically being an ownership-based community that we have <coughs> some based on my guesstimates, something approaching $90 million of value in townhomes and single family homes. I have no idea, except I assume it's considerably more value in KW multifamily. Eventually much more value in phase two, yeah. A and B. Um, and I have no idea how you value the land, except we can't have anything else without it. <laughs> but but we come to the table really as ownership groups that ought to be able to cooperate. And I know that those words are, are words that are uncomfortable, especially potentially for some I folks. I don't think they're uncomfortable, but they're always, and they still are to me, a little bit vague. I guess I, if that's really what I'm trying to get at. Ask away. Well, I mean, I, I, I guess I'd like to understand if, if we're going to go to the site authority and make some recommendations about how things change, I think people like uh, Kelly Long, like, you know, uh, 
uh, Ken Simons, who asked a ton of really good questions at the he time, he's going to, I mean, I think they're going to want to know, how do you see this actually working? I mean, what is the interface going to be? It's one thing for, it's one thing, thing for the HAC to meet and kind of have these issues, but how are you going to interface with, with Ben and multifamily, with Jake and, and, and the Kim? office, I mean, to make, to make it really work so that you are a team working together. So, so I think it's much the way we have been attempting to work. Um, I've been on the HSC for a year, and during that entire time, um, I mean, first of all, the budget advisory group started last year. Those conversations between HSC members, Stephanie Brackman, Jake, and looking at being able to have the records that actually gave us actuals so that we could look at budget numbers and say, okay, we can project. Asking questions of our, you know, walking the neighborhoods with our partners, KW Multifamily, and looking at what we needed to be doing as a group about landscaping and what how that was going to impact costs. The reserve study that happened last year that begins to give us data that deals with our common area of maintenance. All of those things are concrete day-to-day -day examples of what we have been doing. I see us continuing that. Do you see the do you see the HAC then taking more responsibility for some of the decisions? Uh, at this point, unless we want to add a line item for ensuring the members of the HAC against liability. I don't no, see no, 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 I, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about financial. No, you're never, I think okay. your liability so, is so, so, no, 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 let, so let me coming to, So let's say this, coming to you with effective recommendations, I'm a big fan of that old, those old fashioned words called completed staff work. Well, here's what, here's what I'm getting at. I, I think that the site authority would be receptive to some of this if it took some of the responsibility off of the site authority to make these decisions on behalf of the community. So what I'm getting at is, is that perhaps, I'm asking you, say you, say there's a, I mean, I, I know there's some rule, you just brought it up, the rules that people are not, uh, you know, there's a rule that, that you think is being enforced unfairly. Um, so you decide that, so the site authority says to you, okay, you guys talk it out, and you be responsible for what you tell Jake to do and what not to do, and the residents then come to you if they don't like the decision. And then perhaps if they if they still want to appeal it, they come here and maybe it goes further than that if needed. But how does that sound in terms of what I, you're thinking? So I I do not have universal support of that. I think I have a four to one vote right now on the HAC for assuming those kinds of responsibilities. But it is a four to one vote which means as a majority, we would accept the responsibility. And, and if we have a trial run, it's really where our rules committee goes in terms of trying to define things. For example, last meeting, it was approaching 10.30 when we got to um, a, a, the umpty umpth request for approval for a screen door. And, and Gabrielle said, I volunteer to go try to find <laughs> examples of screen doors, and we can have three or four approved screen doors and streamline this. So we, we see where we could make things easier for our neighbors and ourselves if we define things, if they're not as, as wishy-washy as they are right now. We understand that that leaves us open to the need for an appeal process. And I believe there needs to be an appeal sure. process okay. because people will so I'd like to, I'd like to open this up to others on the group here. Uh, uh, so anybody like to chime in on their thoughts on this conversation? Well, I, I really do understand that there's been a lot of thought and energy that have gone into your discussions and what you're bringing to the group. I'm really amazed that any meeting would last till 10 o'clock. <laughs> no, quite frankly, I, I don't mean to Josh. I think there has to be a time limit. I think that a meeting can run, as ours does here, till six, or if you decide from here till eight. I also think that the time limits, and this would be helpful too in any group, are limited to a certain amount of time. If you have something that you want to bring to the group, you have a five minute 
ability to discuss it. I couldn't imagine that the group lasted until 10 o'clock, long beyond anybody's ability to keep attention or awake. The group didn't. HSC uh, <laughs> meetings have two phases. And like the last one actually had three. It had a public forum, it had an HSC meeting, a public invited, and then it had an architectural review meeting that followed. I, I would suggest that maybe there could be some um, suggestion about the meetings have a limited amount of time uh, to consider all that needs to be considered. And, and that is usually done at universities in their core meetings, um, I'm sure on boards of a variety of kinds, but have a meeting start at whatever and last four hours, to me is beyond the pale. Personally, I don't think we need to last for 12 hours as far as I'm concerned. I just want to know, I want to see how we can make the community better by making it. Right. That's, and you know, I but I, I mean, I, and I understand you, you do have a good point. I, I, I'm looking more to the to the direction of what we're talking about here in terms of, of, of expanding some of the the, the the role that the HAC plays in the community in a little more direct way. Miriam, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I do actually. Um, I think that the three committees that have been added are good because it gives some structure to the HAC. Because to be frank, I've gone to them since I lived here in 2012. And it's, aside from an occasional cordial meeting, they basically turn into shouting matches, they turn into bitch sessions, a lot of a lot of complaining, and it doesn't, it, it's not as productive. Right. So, I mean, I think it, there has to, and there's, there's, it's minimal involvement, and you can't force the community to be involved. It, we put, the community members know when the HEC meetings are, to be honest, a handful of people come. Occasionally something gets riled up and we get more. And then it goes back to the basic basic people who care about the community and have some concerns, legitimate concerns. So I think somehow we have to, Jake sends the notice out for the HEC meeting, and I think that um, we need to encourage people if they can't come, if they should be made aware of the three groups that we have, that if they have any concern, any concerns, that they can then bring email directly to that subgroup and they can look at it so that some of the late work can be done prior to it coming to the HAC and then just people exploding because they, well, you know, it's, it's, what it's you were gone saying too far. More structure and we, and we have, yeah. in, in um, right, but Sandy's, Sandy's yeah. recommending, you know, the, the, the all the important. stakeholders um, take responsibility for for working in a cohesive manner, and that's kind of what we do, and that's what, what this group is about, and that's always been the basic, you know, it's like we may disagree.